Hey everyone, and welcome to our Catalyst Spotlight, where today we have our, I just waved back, today we have our <laughs> Catalyst alum and writer-director, Din Tai. Welcome, Din. Hi, Nikki, nice to see you. Thanks for having me. Um, you are so I hope, welcome. I hope that we'll be able to share some valuable information to oh, our always. friends today. Always, I love chatting with you, man. You've directed short films, commercials, and television. Can you tell us how they're different and also how working in one element might influence the other? Sure. Um, short films, are they feel very scrappy to me. You know, the level of talent that we get to work with, um, not, not that this is any sort of jab at the talent, it, but, you know, people are scrappy. People are learning. Mm -hmm. People are a little smaller on budgets. And, and there's a lot. It's a, it's a playing field for you know, for me to learn, for me to make mistakes, for everyone to learn and make mistakes. Mm -hmm. And then in regards to TV and commercials, it obviously the talent involved is much more uh, professional. They're, they're more experienced and more seasoned. And between the two TV and commercials, there's this very parallel hierarchy where in commercials you have your client and then you have the agency and then you have the creatives who are the copywriters and ad I'm sorry the art directors and that equals to a showrunner a writer um, a producing director so you can see that the hierarchies are very similar and so what I was able to learn in commercials and in regards to um, relationships and politics and diplomacy I was able to transfer that to TV. Mm -hmm. So they can kind of cross back and forth that spending a little time in one influences another that you kind of are going in a circle to bring more information back to each opportunity. That's right. fantastic. And, and then s something more granular in the comparison with TV and commercials is that, you know, you'll do a take or in its simplest form, you'll do a take and in commercials, you'll look back at the client or the um, art director or the copywriter, and you'll look for some form of either uh, approval or a note for the second take. And it's very similar to TV. Now, they don't always right. require it. You may have an ego that's so huge that you never turn your head, and that's fine too. But there's this really, there, the system is built on collaboration. And what mm -hmm. I learned in commercials to check in with the um, the, either the client or the copywriter or the art director was something that I leaned in on heavily when doing TV, um, TV episodes. Mm -hmm. I, I, it's kind of just checking in. Sometimes they're fine and they'll just nod their heads and that's fine. But I, I felt like it was an appropriate way to show people that it wasn't just about um, me. Right, of course, that you bring a vision to each opportunity. Obviously, that's part of what gets you hired, but that being a visionary for your own short film is a slightly different seat that you're sitting in where you have to do a little less head swiveling, I would hope, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah, um, and then an additional note, which would be if I have an idea for a certain scene, I don't get to just execute it as I would in a short film. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You got to talk about it. You got to ask the AD, you got to ask the DP, you got to, you know, send it up the chain of command, get it to the showrunner, talk about it. And then whatever documents you have, whatever ideas you have, whatever references you have, you want to present that stuff to the people in charge so that they understand that you're not going rogue. You're not derailing the show a little bit because sometimes, you know, you'll have an idea and it's very special, but it's not on brand and you'll have to convince someone that it's gonna work. Right, right, you're having to, it's a team sport. You're having to share it all with the team. Yeah, for sure. And in your training, you've passed through several of the directorship programs. Why are they important and, and what do they teach you? Every program sets you up for success, but not every program has the resources to handhold their fellows into a, a higher education. Mm -hmm. And so from my own experience, and I can't say that this is for everyone, but this is my own experience. I went through the half initiative, which is Ryan Murphy's fellowship. And then I got into the Disney 
ABC Directing Fellowship, and then I landed my first gig through the NBC Directing Fellowship. It's NBC Universal's Emerging Directors Program. Mm -hmm. So in half, it was, you're going to, I was going to shadow, and I jumped in, and I just started shadowing, and without any sort of understanding of what shadowing is, right? And so I failed that from a personal standpoint, uh -huh. which was a great lesson for me because I had to go through it. I had to like fail in, in order to understand where, what I wasn't doing right. Right. In the Disney ABC program, it was a two year stint and they were very um, in tune with educating our fellows with um, procedure, how to shadow, how to mm -hmm. behave, what the politics are, who's in charge, what the dynamics are, every, like every little thing that you can think of about what goes into a TV show as a director, Disney ABC really touched on. And then they obviously, you know, had panels and asked other um, alum and um, working directors to share their stories and their process with us. And then with NBC, it was very focused, right? We were selected. We all were selected by a show to shadow. And then on that show, we would, we would be guaranteed an episode. And so there were like five classes that were hyper-focused on what that process would look like. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it was very gradual. It was half, I failed half. I learned as much as I could from a textbook educational standpoint at Disney. And then at NBC, it was like, take what you learned from Disney. Here's some more information. Now we go and shadow the right way. And, and then you know, hopefully be very successful in my first episode of television. Wow, that's really awesome. And so astute of you to be able to process it in the way that you did to say, well, I failed up, I failed forward, right? If I had a personal shortcoming in that experience, I took that into the next experience, which is all any of us are doing is just trying all the time yeah. to bring our lessons to the next opportunity. For sure. Now you joined us in 2018 for Catalyst. Yeah. How did your Catalyst experience factor into your trajectory and to your career and where you are now? Well, obviously it was awesome to have been part of, uh, to be welcomed into the, the Catalyst uh, family. And um, you guys obviously have supported my learning process. You know, you kept me in the loop. I got to meet you, feels great. Yeah. And you guys are providing panels for me and everyone else to participate in or at least attend so, so that I can understand what the process is, what we furthering each other's education through our own experiences. I remember one, we did one with, um, about, um, micro, you know, micro budgets, which you and I, when you and I talk about micro budgets, it's like four digits, but then we realized that in the world of Hollywood, micro budget is yeah. a six figure digit. Right. Holy shit. And so th that right. was interesting to talk about and learn and and sort of dissect and figure out how to process that number into a piece of art. Mm -hmm. When you talk about uh, scrappy and humble beginnings, you know, those modest budgets really are places where you have to edit. You have to say, I love this. I love the tank, but I can I can get you know, four guys on the ground and figure out a way to establish whatever it is that we mean to convey, right? You have the yeah. dream budget and then you have the budget that you're you're gonna have. And, and you know, thankfully we've both done well with, with very modest, very humble yeah. budgets. And it prepares you, it prepares you. How can you clearly tell the story with the tools that you have? For sure. And I think that's such an asset. What has been the key to your career so far, do you think? Um, you know, let's, that's a really good question because I think the conventional answer is a skill set, right? That's, I think what I initially would answer this question with is what I do on set, how I think of ideas, how I prepare for something. But mm. I think that's a standard. I think everyone should be able to do those things. I think what right. is, uh, what accompanies that, that, that has helped my success is learning how to build relationships and my own self development, which is, which means like my attitude towards life, my attitude towards challenges, the way one takes on a challenge, um, the way 
I um, interact with people when it's a general meeting with an executive or a showrunner or a producer. What what do those um, interactions look like? And what I focus on is really being able to be personable, open up the conversation to uh, very personal and philosophical discussions because I like that stuff. And if you mm-hmm. don't like that stuff, then you know you'll find you'll talk about something else, whether it's sports or family or you know whatever you can find. And I and I really try to be not talking about the work because mm-hmm. the work is there, right? Like right. If, if at, at this point of my career, I have enough. Um, I have a few pieces that people can watch and the work speaks for itself a little bit. And then, Mm -hmm. and so just to really reiterate, it's learning to be a good listener. This is just my entryway into my self-development. Learn to be a good listener, asking good questions and following up with questions when someone uh, has, you know, when someone says something. Mm -hmm. I love that. Really, truly engaging with, your collaborators and being interested and open. And I think also, like you said, keeping that positive mindset of, we often do this a a kind of in reverse where you find yourself in a leadership position and you go, I must lead, I must always be leading, I must be in charge. And I think we've talked about this in other conversations where you've kind of allowed yourself to kind of fall back and listen a lot more, which I feel like is such a smart way to a ask questions but also kind of encourage people to feel involved yeah and i think that that's so important to having a a strong working relationship where everybody feels supported and heard and as a leader you kind of do the leading bit on the side yeah just by by leading by that example so just a little note on that my instincts you know we all have our first instincts and we have our second instincts right Mm -hmm. and my first instinct is to tell someone something and then I have to check myself and go, yeah. second instinct, ask a question that will lead to the tell. Yeah. So as opposed to, you know, go get this, I would ask, what do you think about something? So mm-hmm. it, it's just a different entryway into in, interacting with somebody. Right. Right. As helping them feel involved, like if they're getting to that uh, decision on their own. Yeah. about what lens to use or what angle to look at. What do you think about this? What, what is your opinion about looking at it from this angle and then moving over here? Yeah. It helps them to feel like they're they're participating instead of just robots executing For directives, sure. right? And you as a person is is a much better person when you do that. Oh yeah. Dental, right? Oh yeah, I feel like that's also a life skill. So what's your take on how the industry is evolving right now? What does it mean for writer and directors like yourself to be represented? That's a big question. Mm. Um, I think in its simplest form, the way the industry is changing is that there are, we, there are more storytellers right now. There's, there are more stories to tell, and there's a willingness for a, from a distribution platform to provide support to tell those stories. And so, I mean, there's, there are so many answers to this question. But I, of course. <laughs> my general sense is that's what I'm feeling. People want to hear more from people like you and I. Right. Right. And I'm not so sure what it feels like to be represented. Um, Because part of me, when I wake up, I don't go, I'm an Asian man. Right. Right. And so I don't really register that immediately. Mm -hmm. But when I get into the world and I realize how people look at me and, and, um, and, judge me, I realize that I have to be subversive Mm. to whatever stereotype they think I am. And so in, if I can remove the re in represented, I present myself in a way that is subversive to what the stereotypes are. Ooh, yes. I dig the psychology behind that. Right. Because there's there's a lot to unpack there, but Oh yeah. I don't have time for that, but of course, you know, when people look at you, they judge you, they Mm -hmm. they put a thing in front of you, especially since, you know, when people are in front of the camera, that's all we ever do to those people in front of the camera. We just judge them. And so how do we present ourselves in a special way? I think that also speaks to authenticity. When you talk about 
A, it's wonderful that your voice could be celebrated as someone who's an Asian American, but is it, does that mean that it excludes you from your individuality, from your own authenticity? Isn't it more important for you to inter introduce yourself as a fully realized human being yeah. and let people understand that that can contextualize their understanding of humanity simply yeah. because the more authentic we are, the closer we are to the human experience yeah. And that's relatable to everyone, right? Yeah, for sure. And it also keeps people who have judged you, prejudged you on their toes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Are there uh, signature touches to the work that you create? Is there anything that has to go in the sauce? Or is it different every time? Um, I think both, right? I think that something that I love about storytelling is that the character goes through discovery from their point of view. So, a com you know, an example of that is, does the character discover something in front of them or does the writer and director present that discovery as a piece of information to the audience? Mm. So I prefer that the character discovers a, something special. Um, and I don't really have a good example, like a really granular example <laughs> of that, but you can see it in a lot of movies and stories where something is just being told to you, but I'd prefer that the character is discovering it. Mm -hmm. um, I like that. Social commentary is very important to me. You know, um, take a theme, address it through story and character. Hopefully the audience can put the pieces together, whether it's immediate, a year, two, 10, 20, 30 years later. At least the math is in there for someone, at least the puzzle is in there for someone to put together. Mm -hmm. And um, going back to the, you know, how we present ourselves, race, racial subversion is very important to me to present a person of, to present a certain ethnicity and then flip that on its head. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know we discussed that about your short film Monday and we'll be coming back to that later, but I thought it, it's a perfect example if anyone's out there watching. Of, of just that, that you're leading with an, an image and an understanding of what something is, and then you kind of flip it, and the audience gets a chance to sort of check and do a little diagnostic about if, if that matches what their uh, presumption was. And I love yeah. that it's motivating people to think about things on a deeper level without hitting them over the head. You're not putting it in a neon sign, you're letting it kind of steep. Yeah, um, and so for anyone who wants to watch my short it's called monday you can watch it on my site uh at dintai.com and in the opening scene what it, the way it's designed is that you only hear the lead character and you the audience are going to make presumptions about this character and then mm -hmm. what you should feel when you finally see the character is that you were wrong about him which in return should say something about yourself oh it does <laughs> it absolutely does. Well played, my friend. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I will carry that into a conversation about how you acquired your attorney or your team of reps. Are they important for a writer director to have? Absolutely. You know, anyone who is on your team is going to um, should show that they love and support you, and that they are willing to do some very simple things to help you connect with other people. So one of the things I love about my reps is that they're always actively trying to make, trying to set up general meetings for me. And so I, you know, that I, it gives me a chance to meet some new people, executives, writers, whomever, showrunners, and I get to practice what we were talking about earlier, which was being this very inquisitive and personable um, person. And, um, and that's great, right? Um, yeah. And if you have very interesting work to share with your reps, then they obviously help dissect what works, what's working in your art and what isn't working and what the marketplace is looking for. And so it, they're got, you know, they're essentially my guardians, my, cause I'm a child, they're the adults and they get to work <laughs> in that fashion. And I get to be a kid when I'm working. So yeah, get to be in the sandbox. Like <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like a, protection thing. And then one really important thing that I've learned about reps is that as much as we think we need them and we want to have them on our sides, 
on our side, there's this special thing that if you can have happen, should happen, they should find you. Mm. We can't go find them. We can't go right. grabbing at them because when they find you, that means they're showing this very interesting part of their character. That means they found you, they reached out to yep. you and they're putting effort into you before mm -hmm. they even need to. So yep. if you can, that's, that would be great. And, and I've been lucky enough to have that happen in a, in a roundabout way. Right. I know mm -hmm. somebody that knows somebody, my, my friend, Michelle nation introduced me to my current managers and she was a friend that I met a couple of years ago and we met randomly at a Asian mixer and she was like, what do you do? And we just started talking and I was like, I'll sure. You want to watch the film? Go ahead. Here it is. And then she loved it. And she's like, I know some managers here. You, and she sent it off. And that's, I feel like the takeaway from that example is that we have to put ourselves out there, go to places, meet people, because mm -hmm. that's how that organic connection happens. It's community. I wouldn't have my, my current representative as, a, as an attorney if it weren't for you, because we spent time together. We had yeah. conversations. We saw that we were like-minded and that, that you know, we that's could right. advocate for each other in those opportunities. Hey, Dan, I'd love to introduce you to this writer. You should meet yeah. them. You should see their stuff. That that's kind right. of stuff is so, so important because it, it makes it a community as opposed to, you know, door-to-door -door salespeople, right? right? Is it you? Is it you? I think right. if like, somebody sees your stuff and then they want to represent it, they're excited to represent it, that means that you're kind of on the same wavelength, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think that that's great. Can you tell us a little bit about what the process has been of developing your award-winning short, Monday, which again is amazing, into a series? Um, it's been very lengthy. I favor trust a little too much. And so that mm. takes a lot of time to meet the right people and find the right partners. Um, mm. I've had to be very patient because it's, we've, we always run into a new partnership and something derails it. And then there's a new partnership and something derails it. And so mm -hmm. I just have to be patient and, and trust that, um, we're still moving forward. And so what it looks like is there's a lot of right, there's a lot of conversation about the, the short and what it looks like as a TV show. And so I'll do some writing, flesh out some ideas and present that to the producers and then they'll give me feedback and I'll revise some of that stuff. And then when it feels like it's in a good place, that'll get sent out to potential showrunners or um, studios and they read it and decide if they want to work on it. And so, you know, that process is, it's very streamlined, but there's a lot of work inside of it. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a lot of back and forth. Of course, it feels like you're building a superhero team and you need somebody with very specific set of skills to complement, you know, your weaknesses or your strengths. And so uh, it's a very delicate balance. And of course the business moving as fast as it does, Sometimes those things come undone and we yep. just hope that they're <laughs> that they're always moving toward a, a better outcome. Yep. Lastly, I'd just love to ask what project or opportunity are you proudest of and what are you working toward? Um, there are a lot of proud moments and um, I recently worked on two episodes of Wu-Tang, an American saga for Hulu. And as a young guy, I love hip hop. And I love what the Wu-Tang did in the 90s. And I could never imagine that I could ever be part of that legacy. And to be asked to, you know, as an Asian American, to be asked to work on a Black American, essentially history, historical hip hop show was like, it's so thematic. It's the East and West thing that Wu-Tang did. And, and it's happening again with, you know, me from from this, this very egotistical uh, standpoint. And, and I'm just, aside from the work, I just like the idea that an Asian man can work on a black American show. Yeah. That at the, when we cross the line of inclusion and diversity, what does that look like? I think it kind of yeah. looks like this. It looks like we can tell the stories that we don't look like. Right. 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 You can tell a story from, you can tell the story of a, of a, of a man, Nikki, 
Why? Mm -hmm. Because, mm -hmm. because you can't. Right. If your if your goal is to deepen someone's understanding of the human experience, again, it's back to that authentic authenticity. You've got threads of of cultural understanding as well as music in Monday too. And I think that that speaks to your interests and your kind of skill set in really representing different cultures and the way that they interact in your own history, which becomes relatable to everyone else. For sure. And you, I could never have that if I didn't grow up the way I did. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, um, what am I working towards? I feel like, I feel like I'm working towards the potential of something. Yep. And it's, I know that sounds abstract, but everything I do, of course, I appreciate and I put my hard work into it. But it's it's all building towards something that is at the moment unattainable. And so I'm lucky enough to be working. I'm lucky enough to be in the industry. And I just want to get enough reps at the batting cages so that the coach will put me in. Yeah. Later. Yeah. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. you know. To keep it connecting, growing forward. Yeah. That's fantastic. I'm so excited for you. Congratulations thank you, thank on all you. that's going on. And thank you as always for sharing your time and insight with us. Yeah. Great seeing you. Great to see you too. Thanks yeah, so much. So for me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye.